when the arrows start coming my way, it's like, he's not a real blues guitar player. I, said, I never said I was one. I said, yeah. I love Yes songs, okay? Okay, I learned all, I, I, you know, I, I love selling England by the pound, okay? I'm a Steve Hackett guy, okay? Uh, I'm a Michael Stanker guy. No one is born successful, and success doesn't just land in your lap. It's kind of like a math equation, zero equals zero. If you do nothing, you get nothing. Joe Bonamassa, he made his career. He didn't do nothing. This guy has worked his butt off and is still working his butt off. Becoming successful is about hard work, self-discipline, and perseverance. And staying successful is a continuation of that hard work, self-discipline, and perseverance. You can't set it and forget it. Now, Joe started his career at age 12 when he opened for B.B. King, and he had his own band called Smoke and Joe Bonamassa, which <laughs> he gigged around Western New York and Pennsylvania. That sounds like a boxer, Smoke and Joe Bonamassa, but only on weekends since he had school on weekdays. He was a kid, you know? Since 2000, Joe has released 15 solo albums through his independent record label, j &R Adventures, of which 11 reached number one on the Billboard Blues chart. And Joe has earned three Grammy Award nominations and owns one of the most extensive guitar collections in the world. I love this guy. He always brings his A game, always crushing it at 150%. Joe Bonamassa. Thanks for having me, Ken. Did I say anything wrong? I got all the stats right, right? You got all the stats right, you know. Um... If you if you look up because we've put out almost forty five albums between the live DVDs and everything, and one of the weirdest stats, and it's nothing. I I think it's just by sheer attrition. So one of the weirdest stats that people never realize is that in the history of the Billboard Blues chart, I hold the all time record for most number ones at twenty five, and that's between the studio albums and the live record. It's it's when they told me that they actually called us one day and said. You know, you just broke the all-time record. I'm like, what are you talking about? You know, like, we just put the records out. We don't care, you know? And 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 especially now, you know, I mean, like, record the recording side of the business is, you know, it's we're, we're in the free sample business. We're giving away, you know, Cheese Whiz and Triscuits at the end of the aisle at Vons. You know what I mean? It's like hoping, hoping somebody will buy something else, you know? It's kind of almost like the horse and buggy business and the car showed up. The horse, all, yeah, it's like it's gone. It's like it's like records. I mean, people like come to me at shows and they'll hand me like the CD. And I've always been fastidious about like you know if somebody goes up to somebody who's been successful in the music business, like, hey man, I really believe in this CD. Check it out. I'm really proud of it. You know, I'll always listen to those. Um, the one, the ones that I sometimes don't listen to is when they'll come up to you and they'll give you the CD and they'll say. Um, I like song two. Don't listen to song five. Well, then why did you put it on there? You know, <laughs> just make an EP, you know, all killer, no filler. You know, that's, you know. Oh, my God. That's funny. I've never heard, never heard that one. That's great. <laughs> so um, what was your wow moment that ignited, you know, like the passion in your heart and soul to be a musician and play guitar? I mean, why guitar? I mean, you know, all of that. What was that moment? My dad played. I'm the, I'm the fourth generation of Bonamassas to make a living in the music business. Um, my great grandfather played trumpet um, and he was in, you know, touring orchestras in the 20s. I actually have his trumpet and a picture of him in 1920 playing with the Mickey Kaleo Orchestra. My grandfather was in the military and worked for the post office, but he also played trumpet and like working working bands back in the 50s and 60s. And my dad being a product of the, you know, the the born in the mid 50s, he came come, coming to age in 1967, 1968, wanted to play guitar like Leslie West. And next thing you know, he plays, he starts playing guitar and he wanted to be like the Beatles. And, and, uh, and then I followed in my father's footsteps because there was always music around. And he was, my parents have always been very supportive of anything that our, you know, both my sister and I, I've ever wanted to do. And I just, when I was four years old, I just couldn't put the guitar down. It was something inspiring about it. I, I, I loved the way it looked. 
you know, I loved looking at the albums and the pictures and people rocking out and old Fenders and Gibsons and, you know, Eric Clapton records and Stevie Ray Vaughan records. And that's basically that was the seed that started this entire journey. And, you know, my dad would bring me to like Italian restaurants in upstate New York where he had gigs and I would sit in for the first set, you know, on a Sunday afternoon. And once I did that and I actually got applause, I was hooked. You know, that was around age eight. I, I started to sit in with my dad's band. And then by the time I was 11, um, I had turned pro. And now I'm staring down the barrel of 35 years in this beautiful effing business that we know is so damn easy for everyone. You know, the, the big thing is I had that support from my mom and dad. That's huge. That is huge. You know, it's a, it's a big, it takes something, you don't have to deal with that. If you've got somebody like, you know, I was talking to D. Snyder the other day, and I mean, and, you know, Twisted Sister, he was wearing makeup and the lipstick, and his dad was a state trooper. Right. Uh, he, didn't, he didn't get that support. Right. <laughs> it's a hard sell. Not, it's a hard sell. That's a hard sell. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Um, that's really cool. I mean, you could have easily gone into trumpet, but of course, rock and roll, electric instruments was in our, in our time, you know. Yeah, and, and, and you know, I mean, you, you cannot discount, I mean, like, I'll, I'll be 46 this year, and a lot of people, my peers are the same age, we all, who all started early on guitar, were, you know, whether we knew each other or not, we're all floored when Stevie Ray Vaughan came out. There was something about when Stevie hit the scene, every, it, it, it gave a B12 shot to the genre, and you're going, hey, wait a minute, this is, you, you can have a beat up old guitar, and it's still cool, and you know, because it, it 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 was in the time in the eighties where things were transitioning from kind of seventies uh, rock and roll to to more of a you know it, it more image based music, and and he just comes out and he's true to himself, and and you know same thing with Mellencamp. He came out, he was true to himself, and it it it, it cuts right through, and that and, you know, and so we all started because of him. And then you go down to do the deep dives with, uh, you know, um, you know, Eric Clapton and Jimi Hendrix and Jeff Beck, the late, great Jeff Beck, you know, Zeppelin and all that. Next thing you know, you know, you're, you're jamming along for hours on a Saturday to a you know, Robin Trower record, trying to figure out how he got that whirly sound on his guitar. You know, it's like it was just it was we had nothing to do. We, it, it snowed a lot. There was no social media. OK, all we had was cassettes, records and a dream. And, and, and there's a lot of me that longs for those days because it was simpler. It was more pure and not everything ended up online. You know, you could make mistakes at gigs. You could F up and, and, and not and not have, you know, a pile on occur on YouTube, you know, and, and yeah, that's for sure. A, a friend of mine, he played a couple of years ago or maybe a year ago. A young kid from from New York, um, and it, he he uh, got booked to play the, the the national anthem on guitar uh, for the uh, NFC or AFC championship game. Let not this year, but the year before. So I was interviewing him on my podcast, and I and and I and I asked him. I said, "Like, dude, like, what was your biggest concern? Because I've done a couple of national anthem gigs, and I just I'm out. I don't want to do it." It's just too much pressure because, you know, and he goes, my biggest fear, and now he's 20 years old, maybe 21, his biggest fear was becoming a meme. And I said, that is so messed up that, 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 that if you make a mistake, like we've all made mistakes musically in life, that you will forever be tarnished with this, this, this meme thing that goes around and goes viral and everybody sees it and you you think your life's ruined it was like in the 80s we didn't have that nobody nobody cared you know it's like you play great maybe there was a guy with a video if he had money and like a vhs recorder you know but it wasn't it wasn't going online there was no one there's a whole different world we live in now and we don't even know half of it i mean it's happening as we're talking about it but that's that's very true i mean did you know like where I grew up, we had a barn on our property. So that was the band house. So like, I, it was like, it was me. I was like uh, school, sports. I was always into sports, homework. And then it was band practice, seven nights a week. We were the hang. My parents were like open. Anybody can come over. 
and we just it was a, it was a hang, but it was rock and roll band practice at my house. And uh, did you when you grew up? Did you have a garage or something where were people practicing at your house? So a lot of people like when you tell them that you you really kind of date yourself, and 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 you 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 give away your uh, uh, location uh, uh, data uh, when you say we used to rehearse in the unfinished basement in upstate yeah. New York, <laughs> concrete, exactly. you know, and and and, and pro tip. If you're going to rehearse in a basement, okay, <laughs> and you have multiple Fender amps running at the same time, ungrounded, okay, old ones, okay, you need to wear rubber shoes before you go <laughs> to the mic and try to sing. Because what happens is you become the earth. You become, you become the third prong on, yeah. the, on, the, <laughs> on the plug. I learned that a couple of times, but it was great because, I mean, like, I mean, the level that in, in which I used to play, even when... Like on the weekends, my parents and my sister were so tolerant of, of it because I would just go down there and blast for hours and they didn't care. They didn't care. They just they just saw something that I was really passionate about. And, you know, we would re rehearse for our, our shows there. And, and it was just one of those things where, you know, you 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 it is what it is. You go with what you got and, you know, load up the car and drive to Buffalo, you know, and that was it. I had the same thing. I was lucky, man. I didn't realize how lucky I was until I heard other people's stories. You know, I'd be practicing all, all over the house, everywhere. You know, in the winter, we didn't, couldn't use the barn, so it was the living room. But, you know, they just dealt with it. So, so how did you, I mean, you kind of already discussed it, but how did you make it happen? I mean, how did you become Joe Bonamassa? Because uh, I know you partnered up with uh, your manager, Roy Weissman, when you guys were partners, which I think is an incredible story, how you guys are the ultimate team. And I think, you know, if you think about teams win Super Bowls, you can't do everything yourself. And it sounds like you 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 got a great partner and he does what he does great, you do what you do great, and together you create like you co elevate each other to greatness because you're both doing great stuff and it's an incredible team. Thank you. I've always been blown away by that. When I heard that story, I went, that is cool on so many levels. So, but how did you become Joe Bonamassa in, you know, in a nutshell? There's been three, three moments of truth, okay, for me in my career, maybe four. Um, Roy and I have been together for, for, for 32 years, 1991, okay? He was, he, he was 22, I was 12. And we've been together 32 years, which is, if you ask around in the business, uh, how long is your how long has your manager been around? It's like, oh, you know, we just hired them last year. You know, like I mean, it's, it's like marriage. Okay, it's like yeah. they don't let, they don't go past four or five years anymore. <laughs> yeah. You know, so we've been together for 30, 32 years, and you know, we we got signed to a development deal that ultimately became a one record uh, deal um, in nineteen ninety three uh, with EMI, and it was with a band I was in called Bloodline and. It was a blues rock band back when blues rock bands were kind of cool. Like you had Brother Kane, which is still out there. Oh, yeah. When uh, David Johnson's just put that back together. Um, and we would run into a band called from the Carolinas called uh, Cry of Love. And uh, Audley Freed, who was a wonderful guitar player and musician, he was in that band. Blew us off the stage multiple times. Um, uh, uh, you know, there was just a, a, a bunch the screaming cheetah willies and then, you know, the archangels and every major record company had a blues rock AOR based band. We were EMIs. It lasted about, you know, three, four years and it, and it imploded like most bands. And I found myself adrift in Utica, New York as a, as a teenager, um, uh, without a record deal, I didn't sing. And I said to myself, I said, self, you, you probably want to learn how to sing so you can at least control enough of your, your, your life where you're not reliant on a singer. If you can do it yourself, it's the only person that can fail you is you. And so my manager and I got together and we talked about it and I started making some squeaky demos and took some vocal lessons and kind of went out there and in search of a record deal in which Everybody passed, every single one, except for one guy, a guy named Michael Kaplan at Sony Music. In, in the throes of desperation, my manager asked Michael, because he knew him from early days, 
um, if, if he knew any bands that were signed to Sony that needed a guitar player because Joe needed a gig. And we sent him some demos and he calls and uh, calls Roy back and goes, I like it. Um, uh, Roy goes, great, you have, a, you have, a, you have a, an, an act that he can go play with? He goes, no, I, I want to sign him. And I was like, okay. Wow. And me, I come down to New York City, which is, it's, it's insane that I'm here now because I used to walk past this building when I lived here the first time. Going, that's where the big shot. You know? Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. yeah right. <laughs> Whatever. Are you the big shot? Yeah. Now I have a sign. You know. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. So that was a that was a big moment in my solo career. So we did one album with Sony. Tom Dowd produced it. Wow. Wow. Which was insane. Um, Tom Dowd, one of the greatest ever. One of the greatest ever, and one of the greatest experience, and one of the nicest people I've ever met in my entire life, and love the man, and. Uh, and we got dropped about six weeks after the record came out in typical fashion. And we then, we then decided, okay, enough is enough. This, this terrestrial music business isn't, isn't for us. And there was times when we both just said, maybe we should just, maybe this, we're doomed. Okay. And we did, we pulled all our money together and we made this record called Blues Deluxe at Bobby Nathan studio in New York. And we started selling them out of the trunk of our cars. And once we figured that out, um, that you could make more selling 30,000 copies out of the trunk of your car than you would have if you sold 1.5 million on a major label, the light goes on. Explain to everybody. I mean, you know, well, I'll just say a lot of record deals, a standard would be 85 for the, uh, the, for the label, 15 for the artist, or 82, 18, and you pay your producer three points. Right, and that before you get done paying them back. Well, yeah, you're paying them back at your points, and it's criminal. You're not going, hey, we, we you know, we need a hundred thousand to recoup the record, so the first hundred thousand goes to the record company. It doesn't work like that. The first, the first hundred thousand goes to the record company, and then they credit you fifteen thousand against the hundred. That yeah, you know, I mean, yeah. never, never go out to dinner with your record company and thank them for dinner. Yeah, they, because you paid for it. Because <laughs> you you paid for you paid fifteen cents on the dollar for that that trip to exactly. Spain. Exactly. I learned that when I was a kid. We had that moment, and we started touring. And then we, we met our partner Ed Venzil, um, who runs Mascot, and he wanted to license some of the records when we go over to oh, Europe. I know, Ed. First time. Yeah, like around two thousand three, two thousand four. Yeah. And there was something about my music over there that had traveled. And we were having a hard time drawing 100 people in the States, getting across the country on our own power. Thank God for people like George Therogood. Thank God for people like Paul Rogers and Bad Company, B.B. King, Buddy Guy, Jethro Tull, that, that would, were nice enough to let me open shows because there's no way we could have made it across the country multiple times. Yeah. And, um, and then uh, we started to get some traction in Europe, drawing two, 300 people. And, We'd come back, we just work. We we're doing 175 gigs, 180 gigs a year. Just kept working, kept plugging a little bit of growth, a little bit every time. And then we hit the UK. And when we hit the UK, something went from three to 500 immediately. We started selling out in advance, bigger places, thousand. Next thing you know, by 2006, we're, 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 we sold out Shepherd's Bush Empire, which to me, you could have said Wembley Stadium, and it would have been the same. You know, it, it's the same equivalency. Yeah, it's yeah, it's all and, and it was like, oh my God, we actually sold two thousand hard tickets. Look at me, yeah. right? Yeah. So, the following couple of tours, it starts to scale, and then we get an opportunity to do the Royal Albert Hall. Oh man, dude! And we 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 didn't think we were going to sell it out. So we, we said, well, the, into the entire UK tour is, it, is it one night at the Elber Hall, Monday, May 4th, 2009. And I wrote Mr. Clapton a letter. I'd met him at a, an event a year before, and I wrote Mr. Clapton a letter stating how much the venue meant to me because of the history in which he um, created in it. And I saw that he was playing there the following week. He was doing his 10-show run or whatever. I said, oh, maybe he's around. And he wrote me back and said, yeah, I'll come play a song too. I'm like, Jesus. Unbelievable. So 
what do you do when you have Eric Clapton coming? You 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 go to the Royal, Royal Albert Hall, and it's two thousand nine. Be the middle of the financial meltdown. Oh, that's right. Exactly. Again, not to be a soothsayer. Anyway, it doesn't matter. You film it. And four years before that, I met Kevin Shirley, who started producing my records. And once he started producing my records, we started going up. Like, we started going up. By the way, when you say going up, is this live and selling records or just live? Correct. He, he, he showed me how to make a real record. And he's like... These are the players you need. And he kept going song, 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 song. He still says song, song, song. I mean, like he just, he's a real producer. And, and so I'm chronologically a little out of order. But Kevin Shirley is one of the, the, the key pivot points in my career in 2005. And we'll be together almost 20 years this year, P and I. So you can see these long-term things. And so Kevin bids it out. He's producing the DVD and the bill comes in conservatively at $250,000. We don't have $250,000. So we go to Citibank, right? To ask them for a loan. And of course they come back and say, well, we'll, we'll loan you some money. But you know, that's, you know, the banking crisis and stuff like that. And, and, you know, years before you could go in with six grand and pull out $3 million. Okay. You know, cause they, anyway, they come back and we're, we will loan you $25,000. We're like, don't waste my time. So we decided to then kind of just tuck our pants into our socks, save every dollar we had and go all in on the Royal Albert Hall, May 4th, 2009. Kevin's producing it. Eric Clapton's coming. Double band. We had Anton Fig and bogey bowls and horns and this huge thing. Which we, we're way over shooting our. Did you actually get two hundred and fifty thousand dollars saved up? We ended up paying for it all because because we didn't we didn't realize we didn't have to pay it all at once. So oh, there we, you go. Because I was gonna say, how did you get two hundred fifty thousand that quick? We we took some IOUs. Kevin got paid down the line. He he understood. Yeah. So we we were able to cover just the cost, and right, we right. and we did a pretty extensive tour going into the into the right into the thing, you know, as a rehearsal and just to kind of generate some money. So out of that 250,000 that you needed, what did you, what was the, the small amount that you had to come up with to get this job done? Oh, we needed a hundred at least to get started. Right. And, okay. There and, you go. And, but you know, that was the equivalent of being at the, the, the roulette table and going all in on 35 black. Okay. Right. You're going, that's, that's it. If this thing fails, we're out of business. You're and, done. And yeah, maybe I would still have a career, but we would have been out of business. And, and you have to look at it from those, that perspective. But it's, it's interesting because let's say you, the, the label gave you a bunch of money and you're only making 15 cents on the dollar. Uh, if that failed, you'd still be out of business. And you could, or you'd owe them forever. You'd never, you'd be, you'd be working for them like slaves. So in a way. And, and God forbid you sign one of those deals that, encapsulate you on a brand level like uh, to, uh like like merchandising and what they what they referred to as the 360 deal yeah they really <laughs> own you like you lose your yeah. name okay if you if you sign a deal like that with like like is yes, joe bonamassa they own that the first thing they do is go to the trademark office and trademark your name so you can't even tour under your name yeah it, it, prince this was the whole prince thing when he yeah. turned yeah. his name into a symbol this, yeah. is the, this is the concept of Warner Brothers. Yeah. So anyway, long story short, we do the gig, it's triumphant. We put the DVD out and it sells okay. And we, but we are able to keep the company going. What's okay? It's for a DVD. I mean, we're selling 25,000 copies, you know, in the States. Um, it's platinum. It's platinum. Uh, it, it's a platinum DVD now. Woo! Yeah. yeah. And the... All of this work, all of these experiences, all of these shows and, 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 and fiscal decisions and business all comes to an apex curve as soon as the Albany affiliate for public broadcasting, PBS, um, come, calls our office randomly going, hey, we know Joe's from these parts. 
do you think he would be interested in, in allowing us to use an hour edit of his DVD with uh, at, at Royal Albert Hall for our pledge drive? And I'm like, yeah, I'll be the annoying concert on PBS that 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 they break into every five minutes to ask for money. I was like, great. You know, and, we, and we've been hoping PBS would approach us. And um, so we come out in 2009, um, fall, late summer, 2009. And this thing explodes. When I tell you it explodes because it's TV and, the, you know, in L.A., Channel 8 is PBS, Channel 7 is ABC. There's no differentiation anymore because the, the, the big cable companies were 500 channels and people would flip through and just see if and, and people like concerts. Yeah. Next thing you know, I'm on there, you know, I'm the edgiest thing on PBS for years. You know, it's like Lawrence Welk and, uh, you know, Reading Rainbow and, and the Celtic women and me, you know, <laughs> I stick out. And these things start scoring high numbers as far as the pledge drives and the tickets just go crazy. And wow. that was the big moment in which put me on the map in a, in, a, in a sense where I was like, I went from a thousand seats to 3,500 seats. And I was like, I don't know what, it was a roller coaster ride. And it was like being shot out of a cannon. Um, and but with that, I will say this, everything that I worked for was coming to fruition. Everything that Roy and I and Kevin and the entire team worked for had come to fruition right in front of our eyes really damn quick. There was no crossfade. It was like brick wall. What I will say to anyone in the business or anybody who, who has a business that's about to enter the salad years is, is two things. One, congratulations. And two, mo most importantly, be prepared to work harder than you ever have in your life to maintain it. And that's been the last 16 years for me. Well, the thing that's real clear to me and uh, I can totally relate is that all of this hard work, which uh, obviously nobody had to tell you to practice and nobody had to tell you to, you know, you self-motivate yourself. But the, the bottom line is this is all driven by passion. It's not up here, man. It's coming from here. It's like you love what you do. And when you love what you do, that's how you overcome the setbacks and the obstacles. Because you, what was fueling you, that something was fueling you to keep going. And it was because you love to play guitar. You love music, right? It, it was this blind belief in myself. And Roy and I have the same thing. We, we were like Marines, okay? It's, it's, it's a, that's a false equivalency. But, but we have the mentality, it's like, you're going to get knocked down. It's going to be a, it's, it's going to be a struggle. It's going to be, it, you know, life is a struggle. And, and, and you're not, a, we're not a victim of anything other than what we choose to sabotage ourselves. So if we don't want to sabotage ourselves, then, then you're going to be completely, you know, in the driver's seat when your opportunity comes, you know, because when your opportunity comes, that's when you hit the gas. But if you're not in the driver's seat and the engine's not yeah. running, yeah, that latency could could push you back. You know, I mean, I will I will say this that that I've had a lot of people help me over the years, and and it takes a village. I mean, I'm I'm the face and the brand of it, but but without Roy, without Kevin, without any of these people that that everyone from 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 uh, Rachel Iverson who runs our office and Sal DiMartino and Bobby Akizian and Tamara, you know, I mean, the, the people go like, oh, you have, you have, you have a good credit score. I go, Tamara, okay, she's the one who pays it on time. You know, I'm like, because I'm, I'm on the road, you know, and so at the end of the day, you know, I'm extraordinarily lucky um, and fortunate to, to be in this position in life at 45 years old after doing this for 34 years. But at the end of the day, I also feel that, that, if I didn't push myself and continue to push myself, that I'd be, I'd just be an also ran and maybe it never was. And, and, you know, that's, I couldn't, I just couldn't do it. The, the, the fire burned too passionately for me to sit there and go, well, yeah, yeah, you know, I'll get around to it. 
or I don't really care. No, you, you got to care and you got to care and you got to want it more than the next guy. That's the simple, simple fact. Well, you, 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 you picked what you care most about. I mean, that's, and it's music and I have a feeling you would be great at anything that you love doing. I mean, do you have like other, if it's not music, is there any other one other thing you like doing? Or what if you, what if suddenly you, you know, people always ask, well, what do you do if you didn't play drums? You weren't in music. I said, I'd figure it out. Yeah. Because I, you, I'd figure it out. I mean, I'm going to eventually be drawn to something. Maybe it's yeah. mud wrestling. I don't know. But yeah, exactly. And, and it's like, you know, if I wanted to sell, you know, if, if, if I wanted to start a nursery on Ventura Boulevard, I'd have the best damn cactuses in, in L.A. County. It's like I, I, I want to win. And selfishly, it, you know, I, I want to win. I don't want to place or show. And, and, and that's the Italian in me talking. And that's the New Yorker in me talking. Yeah. And, and it's just the way I'm wired, you know. That's great. And it's. It's not that I want to see other people lose. Yeah. You know, not, I don't want to win at others' expense. Right. I want to plow a lane of my own in which I can then turn and look back and help people use the lane to, to get where they want to be. And we've done that for the last decade. We've been helped, you know, we started a, a 501c3 called Keeping the Blues Alive. Now it's a label. Um, you know, we've done records for everyone from Jimmy Hall to, to, to Larry McRae, Joanne Shaw Taylor, uh, produced records for Eric Gales. And it's like, you know, it, 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 it's, it's like, listen, the, there's the lane. We're just the snowplow. You know, we've, we've kind of forged the lane for ourselves and, and not at anybody's expense. There's plenty of room in any genre of music for, for good, old fashioned, friendly competition that I think makes you know, um, everybody better. If Gary Clark Jr. comes out and makes the, the hell of a record, I, I want to be like, okay, I, let's let's get to work. Don't get complacent. Like, you know, respond to it in a friendly, non-competitive way. Be like, man, we got to up our game. He's killing it. You know, yeah, exactly. Kenny Wayne Shepherd, man, it's like oh, they're killing it. We, we we can't sit here and just do the same old thing. You know, so it's it, it's it, it's the way I'm wired. That's great. Well, no, that's huge. I, I, I totally can relate to that. And, you know, you, uh, like I said, you don't want to set it and forget it. That's that you're, you're dead. As soon as you set it and forget it, you're done. And you, you're getting the most value out of life. You just get a short life. So why not get the most value out of this short life, you know, we have? And, and you, it's good to be self-aware that you are wired that way so you can take advantage of, like, this is what I am. This is what I do. It doesn't matter if I'm growing plants or playing the blues. You own it. You have to own it. You, it's your responsibility. It's 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 yes. Doesn't matter how big an artist you get, how many private jets you charter. Okay, you're responsible for a lot of people's livelihoods. I look around, and I, we have four buses, three trucks. Okay, and and a lot of people pushing stuff, setting stuff up, making sure that this idiot looks okay at eight o'clock. I wake up every day going, I'm responsible for tenured people that have children in college. Yeah. Their livelihoods, you know, I mean, like that's, you have to look at it from that point of view. That's great. Hey, so did you ever, I mean, was it always the blues or did you ever want to be Eddie Van Halen, you know, or, you know, something that was like prog rock? Because didn't you do something, wasn't there something I read about UFO? I auditioned for UFO. Yeah. Yeah. So that I did Pete Way's last record. Oh, you did? Oh, he was yeah, such a nice least, guy. I didn't get to meet him. He didn't meet him? Oh. No, I was doing nice it guy. here. And he was not healthy to travel. So yeah. I, but I felt, oh man, I loved, I mean, his, the feel and the melodies and the hook lines. And, and yeah. so, so you could have been, so what I'm saying is like, yeah, you made it as a blues guitarist. But if you joined UFA, UFO, you would have been a rock. Yeah. And, you know, I always say when, when, you know, when, when the, when the, when the arrows start coming my way, it's like, he's not a real blues guitar player. And I never said I was one. I said, yeah. I love yes songs. Okay. <laughs> okay. I learned all, I, I you know, I, I love selling England by the pound. Okay. I'm a Steve Hackett guy. Okay. Uh, I'm a Michael Shanker guy, you know, and a Richie Blackmore guy, you know, I mean, it, it, it's like, and, and, you know, there's, to me, there's, I think life would be boring if I only played one style of music all the time. 
that's not to slight anybody who does it that way because everybody has their process. But I'm so I, I'm, I'm ADHD in life and I'm ADHD in music. It's like it, it's like oh, I, I want to try that. I want to try to get that sound. You know, I mean, when Hot for Teacher came out, you're like, holy. Oh, God. my God. Like, no, the swagger. And, and it, you know, and, yeah. and and you're just going, it didn't sound real. You know what I mean? It's like eruption. And yeah. it sounded sped up, but you realize, and then you go, you go to tune one of these things and you realize that it's like, oh no, he's, he's playing in regular tuning. So there's no trick there, you know? And so he, you know, he was a game changer and same thing with Hendrix and, you know, um, I, I, you know, Mick Ralphs, you know, this is Paul Kossoff. I mean, those kind of guys, those were, those were my guys because, they were rock, but they had a blues edge to them and they had great songs in this big Les Paul tone that I always wanted to get. And, and so I've, I've, my career is we've done all kinds of records, not just blues. We've done trad blues, but I've also done records with Glenn Hughes and Jason Bonham, Derek Sermini. We're about to do our fifth one. That's straight up seventies, you know, heavy rock, British rock. It, it, it's, it, you know, I, I like to know that 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 I can speak all the languages, you know, and and you have to exercise that the, if you know, if you speak French, but you don't speak French for 20 years, you get, you're rusty. So I like to try to keep my thing fresh. All that stuff, though, influences what you do in your own music. That's the beauty of it. All that stuff. You just you just a, you're a guy who wants to keep learning. And why not learn from the best? I mean, Richie Blackmore is the best at being Richie Blackmore. Hendrix is the best at being... Oh, are you kidding me? That's incredible. You, you're inspired by that. You're never going to sound like those guys, but you can grab something and then you bring it into your style of music. And so it makes you... You create your own thing from all of that, you know? Everybody is, is an amalgamation of their influences. There's very, very few people that are immaculate conception guitar players and maybe you know like warren hayden says it best about albert king you know he, he's like he's the only person i can think of that was an immaculate conception guitar player where nobody played like him before and then everybody was like oh wow this is devastating but then you figure out well albert king his born name is albert nelson jimmy vivino told me that albert nelson played drums with jimmy reed he was a drummer what yeah, I didn't know that. He was a drummer. His his born name is Albert Nelson. And you'll win, by the way, you'll win Rock and Roll Jeopardy any, yeah, any, yeah, any yeah. bar, okay, with this fact. Look it up. It's 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 on Wikipedia. He played drums with Jimmy Reed. Jeez. So he was coming from a totally different point of view. You know, I mean, so when he picked up the guitar upside down, he invented this thing that created riffs and tunings that that he he invent he took the guitar that was a fixed instrument and went nah i'm not buying this i'm going to do it upside down i'm going to tune it to was an open f or what you know it's through the albert king tune open g minor and coming up with all these different positions and nobody sounded like him wow that's amazing well i think that um you know finding solutions to problems or finding solutions to things in general uh, requires creativity. You know what I mean? So this guy created his thing by, you know, he obviously did the guitar upside down. He was trying to figure out how to do something. And he, with, with this creative mind and his open mind, he created his thing. So which leads me to like, so, you know, <laughs> You said you did all these records, including the live ones. So when you, what is your approach? Do you have a method to, let's say you're going to start a record next month. How does that process start? Do you watch cartoons? Do you watch movies? You know what I mean? What is your method? I, you know what I start doing is, is I, I just kind of, sometimes I stop myself if, if I'm talking to someone and I hear somebody say something clever. You know, and I one of our one of our songs that we play almost every night is is a is is a is a is a song called "Just Cause You Can" don't mean you should. And I and I and I wrote it with a, a, my friend Tom Hambridge, and and uh, I just remember watching some one of those crazy shows on TV 
like you know like it's it's almost like what, what was it jackass or it was, it was like where people just do dumb stuff that could get them killed like with golf carts like let's jump golf carts and then they fall off and they're hauled off in an ambulance and i just remember like i was riffing about that with tom and i said man just you know sometimes just because you can don't mean you should and he goes there's the song let's write it and we just did and 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 so you when you're in the writing process you you have to be kind of conscious of of these little nuggets that sometimes because we're all we're all characters you know and, yeah. and and if you could say it um in a way that's your own like eric gales is a master at that when we worked on his record he didn't have any songs and his whole record came out of a single conversation that he and uh our co-producer josh smith had at josh's studio in uh in uh, tarzana um and and he was just going off and I'm just listening and Josh is talking and I'm not saying much cause I'm on my phone, like going, that's a great way to say that. So we wrote all these songs based on what he was saying and tried to write them in his own voice, you know? And when we would approach him with lyrics, it would be like, Eric, he's like, man, I'm not feeling it. I'm like, okay, great. How do you feel? Like, what would you like the same sentiment? Now tell me how you would say that yourself, you know, because then then it becomes his own. And so that's what I try to do is, is I try to just collect little nuggets because li- starting with lyrics is so much easier if you have a good set. Of oh, lyrics really? Then the lyric. you, because if you're just jamming, you're like, OK, what do you want to say? Well, I woke up this morning. Oh, God, not again, please. Yeah, know? not again. <laughs> but what about you? I, you like, ever- I woke up this morning. Oh, no, 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 no. Right? <laughs> No. <laughs> do you ever like? Do you ever like write a song from like a, like a, a hook line, you know, like yeah. a melody, or, or if you're working on because you know you're probably always working on tones and this and that or tunings and stuff. Does that ever like send you into an inspiration? You know, it's funny. I was I, I was in uh, Abbey Road Studios and I was co-writing with Bernie Mars to, from White Snake, and this was for our album Royal Tea um, that we did in January of 2020 in London. Unbeknownst to us, something was about to happen in the next couple. Yeah, of years. Oh, yeah, seemed pretty normal to me. Yeah, and um, and we were about to wrap up for the day. We'd already wrote a, 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 a one really good song that made the record, and we're in this little room upstairs at Abbey Road. I dragged some gear up, and you know, and you playing loud, and the old lady next door would be like, "Are you done yet?" You know, like, like this is a studio. Talk to the men. You know. Which studio was it? I've recorded. Abbey Road. Them. <laughs> which, they have a little, annex, they have little annex studios off property that are around the corner. It's like, it's a studio. We're supposed to play loud. Anyway, we ended up writing a song on the spot because I was, he was curious that how my Marshall Blues Breaker sounded with his 59 Les Paul. And I said, well, let's plug it in before we go. Plug it in. Uh, and I come up and I'm just showing him, you know, diamond and everything. And I start playing this riff and he goes, there's a song. Let's, let's, we wrote it in a half hour. Wow. You know, and That's it, it, you never know when it's going to happen, but you have to kind of be in a position when you start writing, you, you, sometimes you have to write a couple of duds just to get the wheels. Yeah. Cause I don't write every day, you know, I, yeah. I'm not one of those guys with, you know, like Dylan, where he's constantly with a pad and writing. Stuff. Right. Yeah. Right. What about like, do you ever think about, oh my God, uh, I got to stay relevant. I mean, you know, we're getting stuck in this place. I mean, and, and things things start changing around, you know, in the world, not just in music, obviously. Well, how does that, how, how do you relate to trying to stay relevant? Because creative ideas do help you become or stay relevant, you know. And uh, but when I was with Mellencamp, I mean, that was the, it was always like, oh, my God, I'm going to lose my record deal. I'm going to lose my record deal. We got to come up. He, he was demanding us. He'd say, Yux and you guys, I need ideas. I need ideas to get these songs on the radio. And I know he was trying to stay relevant. Nah, we've done that before. We got to do that. But he was trying to be, you know, in the top 10 on the Billboard Top 100, uh, you know, singles. That's a whole different competition right there. But yeah, I, I will say it's about relevancy in, in terms of my career. I've never been, never will be. OK, I do a very specific thing. I know exactly what the fans want to hear. And sometimes with, with, so would you rather, so the question is, is would you rather 
please the critics at Rolling Stone or please the fans that put you there? My answer unequivocally is please the fans that put you there. So if that means once a record, there's got a there's a big sludgy blues rock song with an overblown solo at the end, I'm doing it because <laughs> yeah. that's what people seem to enjoy. Yeah. And, you know, um, I, I'm not, you know, I'm not the one that's going to come out drastically change the show. I'm like, you know, I, I'm not feeling playing guitar and I'm just going to stand up here and sing for you. What are you crazy? These people, this is what they paid for. They, you know, it, it's, this is the experience that you're selling. And I find now that looking at the guitar world in general in 2023, I find it in a very, very, uh, I find it in a state of crossroads because people have learned how to make real money um, by sitting in front of a camera and putting it on Instagram or YouTube and, and becoming an influencer, which is great. I, I encourage anybody with a, with a, a, a business model um, to do it like that. How long you can stay inspired doing one minute videos is up to the individual. And I find that 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 if I feel the need to stay relevant because I haven't posted something in a minute and I just go, well, here, let me I haven't played guitar today, but let me let me tune this Les Paul up and and do a one minute video. And I be, I've been guilty of this in the past where that one minute that it took me to film something one take and just throw it on Instagram was the only minute of music I had made that entire day. And I was like, that's not, that's not for me. It's that that's crossing a line where your, your inspiration is the dopamine that you're going to get from the, from the comment section of your social media. And so, you know what I mean? It, it, that, that, that seems a little for, for me personally, that that's not the kind of lifestyle I want to live. If I, if, if I don't feel like playing guitar today, like I haven't played guitar in a week. We got off tour last week. I haven't played, I haven't picked one up and I live in a house of guitars. There's tons of them. Okay. Right. You have, you have a ridiculous collection. Collection. Yeah. And it's and, like it, your house is, your museum, right? And that's where all the guitars are? Or, well, most of the guitars, to... yeah. M most of the guitars are at my house in Los Angeles. Um, and, you know, I mean, the collection, the collecting part of it, that's a different, that's a different career. You know, it's a different yeah. type of thing. And, it, you know, it, it, people are curious about, about you know, in, in it, about it. And I just said, well, my dad was a guitar dealer in a, a different life. And, and I grew up in a music store. And I always loved the old guitars. And when I could start affording them, I started just buying vintage guitars. And luckily, I started buying vintage guitars when they weren't as expensive as they, as they are now. And I could get better deals, you know. Um, but the thing about collecting is I look, I, people are going, oh, my God, they come to my house and they're overwhelmed. And it's overwhelming. <laughs> if I went into it blind, not knowing what to expect or just seeing a few pictures on Instagram, you're going the sheer magnitude of it all would overwhelm <laughs> even the most jaded collector. But the difference is I live there. So I wake up, I get my coffee. There's hundreds of guitar amps. Around. It doesn't matter. You know, it's organized hoarding. It, it's, it's the core memorabilia. Signs blinking. But when they get down to asking the critical questions, it's, it, it, it's why I don't, well, I have an addictive personality. Um, my answer is always, if you have to ask that question, why, then you don't get what it's a, like being a collector, because there's a certain thing about collecting your, that you are, you're doing something temporarily that will eventually be broken up into bits. Like I know 500 guitars, 500 amps, 1,000, 1,200 pieces in the collection eventually I'm not going to be around and this whole thing. Yeah. This nerdville Gotham sign may either be thrown away in the dump or some, some kid will have it in his basement going, I got bottom Oss's old son, you know, but while they're under my custodianship, my job is to preserve them and, and love them and 
and promote them. You know what I mean? Meaning that like, you know, you know, it's like, here's a 54 Les Paul in pretty darn good condition, you know? And so I got it in this condition and, and, and my job is to play it, love it, use it live, but don't beat the hell out of it. So it, you, you don't recognize it. You know, my ego is not that big. Uh, to go, well, I'm just going to destroy this guitar because in, in service of my music, it's like, uh, you could do that with a new guitar. You don't need to do it with this one. It all sound the same. Do you, do you sell those? Uh, do you keep everything you buy or you sell and buy other things? Is there that kind of thing? I remember I was in the studio and John Shanks bought a, it was in Henson, and he says, oh my God, look at this. It was a Les Paul he bought, might have been 285000 or something. But he said, I had to sell three others to get this. Once you start getting, start, once you start collecting Sunburst Les Pauls and flying V's and all that high end stuff, it's expensive game. And, but you know, what I do is you could tell, you know, like I, I, I I'm more businessman than, than I am a musician in a lot, of, a lot of ways, the way my head, my head is wired is I always remember the, the, the CEO of General Electric and my manager and I always talk about this. He, his whole thing was you have to clear out the bottom 10% um, every year. To, and in his case, it was kind of cold and heartless. He was talking about employees. He, he would take the, the bottom 10 performing 10% of his, his employees and, 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 and lay them off and bring in new people, hopefully to raise the baseline. And not not the baseline, the baseline. Um, so I'm not as uh, maybe the guitars think I'm cold and heartless, but what I do is every year I take I take stock of what we have, and I may sell five percent just to just to go. You know what? I'm never going to get to this. I'm never going to play it. It's just it was something. The addiction was roaring. I was in Des Moines, Iowa. You know. And so, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll quietly take down five, maybe 6%. Or if, you know, if somebody like really wants something, it's like my, here's my dream guitar. I've been looking for my whole life here is a, is a 54 Les Paul. I'll be like, you can have it. not for free, but you can have it. You know what I mean? I got six or seven of these, you know, and it, it, so the sentimentality factor comes into that. You know, if you're not sentimental about stuff, and then there's certain things you're going to bury me with, okay? And it's just non-negotiable. Do you have a favorite guitar? I mean, that you, out of that collection, or a favorite five, or is there a certain? It, it depends. You know, it, it, they're all tools. You know, and there's not one size fits all. I'm not like you know, like a, you know, I'm not like a Rory Gallagher type, where we're neither musically or you know, yeah, you know, on stage. Like Rory played that Strat a lot, but he had a big guitar collection. Um, but he he played that Strat, and he could basically do his whole show on that. Wow! Strat. Wow! I can't do that. I I I need the Les Paul for this song. I need the Telly for this song. Yeah. So I mean, there's like there's ones you just go these. This is a great instrument, you know. But it's the same thing of like wooden snare, brass snare. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You can't just go, well, this is what I always use. You got to service the music. You know, I used to, back in the day when, you know, I had drums in New York, Nashville, L.A., Indiana, Japan, Germany. You know, when we were selling records, they'd fly me everywhere. And when that changed, that's why I moved to New York, moved to L.A. and I got my own studio, Uncommon Studios. But I remember when I'd have the cartridge guys just bring these 100 snare drums. A hundred. Hundred, yeah, but the thing is, I, it would always end up being the, these three, unless there was a, you know. And the other thing is, back in the day when the budgets were big, you know, you could spend weeks making a record, and then everybody was like, "Oh, what snare are you can use on this song?" Now, I mean, I just come in and I, and it's it's my hands that make the changes. I mean, wood versus wood versus metal, uh, shallow versus deep, of course, but. This is really one snare drum, one or two. It's my own model that covers everything now. Where it, you know, just does. It seems to work sonically. Yeah, and you know, there used to be. You know, I, I used to hear about these these um, the, the stories of like, you know, um, you know, it took six weeks to find a comfortable chair. You know, at twenty five hundred a day. You know, <laughs> yeah, exactly. it, 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 it took us a week to get drum sounds. A week. Yeah, a this week. Is a whole record. You know, and 
it, you know, again, it's like in the business now, it's like whatever, whatever digit was in that first number, okay, whether you spend $300,000 on a record or $3 million, okay, no matter what strap, now you drop a zero on the right side, and that's pretty much what your budget is. Now it's 30000 300,000. If you sold 3 million, now you may sell 300,000. If you sold 300,000, you'd be lucky to sell 30,000. And that's pretty much the business because I'm talking to you on a laptop that doesn't even have a CD player. I don't have a CD player in this apartment. I don't get who's buying. I haven't seen a record store in a wild, like for a while. I mean, there's, yeah, they sell vintage vinyl and a few CDs, but it, Never. It used to be like the Virgin Mega Store and all this stuff. Long gone. Yeah, well, you know, I remember when it went from LPs to cassettes. I went, oh, okay, you can put the cassette in the car. But then when it went to CDs, I'm like, okay, okay, this is it, right? This is it. No, no. It went, it went to the iPod, to streaming, to downloading, to YouTube, which is, if YouTube is the biggest platform for listening to music, which is free. Free. It's like, I wish uh, airplane tickets were free, and I wish groceries were free, and I wish gas was free. But in our business, all of a sudden, our main product is free. Unbelievable. And, you know, it was funny, you know, like, you know, because I have yeah, friends in the movie business and stuff like that. And they always used to glow. It's like, oh, well, we still, we're still killing it at the box office. I said, it's going to happen to you eventually. Yeah, of course. Look out. Yeah. Then stick around. Stick around. Stick around long enough and you're going to find it. And look at it now. It's, it's $10 a month for your streaming service. And you can watch anything, anytime you want, however you want. And, and you know, the, 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 the box office is down. But that's how they used to pay for the movies. You know, so you can't spend three hundred million dollars on a blockbuster unless there's going to be people paying twenty dollars a ticket to go see it. You know, and, and that's 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 a big deal. It's a real big deal. And 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 you know, so that kid from Napster ruined it all. <laughs> well, Mike, the labels didn't embrace it at first, but they sure scored in the end. And they were arrogant about it. They tried to just snuff them out. Yeah, they tried to snuff them out. But they, they won because they owned the masters. We like, for people who don't understand this, it's like when you get a record deal, oh, here's money to make the record. But in that contract, in most cases, the record label owns those master recordings. And they eventually sold those master recordings to iTunes and Spotify at humongous dollars because they own those final recordings. You know, I, I, re I redid my Sharona. Note for note, so I can write every note out because the band, the two remaining guys in the band, the singer and the drummer were dead. Figer and Bruce Gary is the drummer. And the band, so wh whoever owned the master could say, for let's say uh, a movie was being made, they wanted to use My Sharona. And the people who owned the master could say, wow, that's going to cost you half a million dollars. Well, the band might have sold it for 100000 or to lease it for 100000 So I redid every single note I got the, I asked for every mic position and they read it and I wrote everything out and it was like way more complicated than I realized. But point is, I duplicated what the drummer had done. Then they took the second best vocal. Apparently they could do that. And they replaced the bass and the, the guitars. And all of a sudden they now had a, a version of my Sharona that sounded like the original. So they can control, but that's rare. They can license it themselves. And, yeah. and we've been doing this our whole careers. You know, we own every piece of catalog. We own oh, man. Recordings. And and the reality is, is there is money to be made in streaming if you are the if you are the holder of the master recordings. Yes. So you go down the street. I live close to Columbus Circle here um, in New York. You can walk just down the street from my apartment building and you can see Universal Music. They're still operating. And what they are now is their catalog management and basically their entire catalog, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of, of, of recordings and are now available for streaming. And they're, they're just sitting there making fractional pennies every time somebody clicks on a universal own and they get a big check either at the end of the year or quarterly, however they, whatever they work their deals out. In. And, and, and it's way more profitable doing it that way than it is to, pay songwriters oh my god god forbid um and 
packaging CDs, shipping CDs, having return reserves, having the Harry Fox, you know, the old Harry Fox situation where the so, you know, songwriters collective and um, checks have, you know, and, you know, and, and the producers get screwed, the songwriters get screwed and the artist gets nothing, nothing, you know, but unless they own their master recordings and now you're starting to see, you know, hedge fund banks buying master recordings from artists directly and they're paying 25 times on the hot one, 25 times uh, EBITDA or whatever they want to call it or multiples on, on, on your gross. Yeah. And um, so, you know, and artists that are in their late 60s or 70s going, you're just giving me, you're giving me a check for the rest of my life. I'm done. I don't have to collect anything anymore, you know. And there's a law that at a certain point, I don't know if it's 25 years or 35 years, those masters that you recorded and that the label owns, they come back to the to the artist or the songwriters. And that's where you're seeing them going like, you know what? I mean, Springsteen sold his masters for, uh, I think, $500 million. Why wouldn't he? And then you can also put it in, you know, in, uh, you know annuities. There's different ways you can construct it, which can be in you know, be passed on to your kids and whatever, but, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it's interesting, an interesting time. So, okay. I got to ask you about the glasses thing. Cause I'm a glass guy. I started what I, I put glasses. It was an accident. My kid put them on me as I was walking on stage for the very first, uh, smashing pumpkins concert I ever did when I did the adore tour in 1998. And I went, it, it, they matched the, it was like yellow goggles. And they matched my shirt. I had a yellow stripe down a black shirt. I said, oh, yeah, sure. If my kid wants me to wear them, I'm wearing them. And the next day in the paper, all they talk, they didn't even talk about my drumming. They talked about my glasses. So I went, all right, I guess that's what I do now. And I didn't know any, nobody talked about branding back then. So I remember finally I went, this is stupid. I took them off and I got more crap for not wearing them. So I put them back on. So it became my thing. You know, lucky me, I got a brand. So, but, and you look great with glasses. What, is, is it the same thing or? Well, you know, sometimes necessity is the mother of invention. So I have this thing. When I used to play clubs, like real, we were playing pretty modest places. It, the, they had, a, if you were lucky, if you were playing like the Mason Jar and outside of Phoenix, they have lights in coffee cans and they turn them on. Okay. <laughs> As my as my fortune started to grow a little bit, and we started graduating to small theaters, we actually had uh, was people that would operate spotlights. And I'm very light sensitive, so if there's like a real bright light, I squint a lot, and I sometimes tear up, and it's very distracting. So when I'm on stage now, there's two forty thousand watt spotlights, center stage, coming in hot. So I use the glasses. It just takes the it takes the two K off, so I can I can concentrate, and it just it does that. When I get off stage, I don't wear the glasses, um, and and like I'll walk around any I could walk around anywhere anytime, and 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 with a baseball hat on, no glasses, and nobody will even give me a second look, even outside of my own concerts. I can just go right to the bus. Nobody looks like a roadie, you know? And um, the minute I put these on, yeah, something happens. And like, are you Joe? And I'm like, yeah. you should just ask the glasses. <laughs> you know? I know, but it's I, true, and, though. Yeah. And, and, it, and it, you know, I mean, it just, it, it just, and then it just became a thing, you know? Yeah. And I, it just became a thing. And I become the, you know, in 2006, my producer, Kevin, said, hey, listen, you need to start dressing up better than than your audience. You look like a slob up there sometimes. And I was like, oh, don't worry about just jeans and a shirt. And he goes, that's not star time. And he goes, you're, he goes, ask, you know, he goes, ask your friend B.B. King. He dresses up. It's star time. I'm going to go, say no more. So then I start wearing these stupid suits. And then I found a couple of brands that fit me well. And it, it, then I, next thing you know, I became the guy in the suit and the glasses. And, and it was just kind of at that point searching for something that – an image to put to this sound. And, and that was it. You know? And it was just the, 
it was a perfect storm of things happening all at the same time. It was the the record, the ballad of John Henry did so great. Then it was, you know, the follow-ups and then the PBS stuff and, 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 you know, and then becoming the guy in the suit. Next thing you know, here we go. And the key thing is, and it works real well for you, it looks real. It looks authentic. It's not like you just put something on like, it doesn't, it looks like that's what you should be wearing and the, and it goes with your music. And so it's, it's, a, it's a complete package, you know. And I credit the influence of two, two, two sources. One, I, I was flipping through a book about the blues and I, I come upon a picture of, and it's a pretty famous photo, Muddy Waters in a backstage area in, um, in the UK. And he's got this great custom suit on. There's a, there's a bottle of Johnny Walker Black on the table. It's just, you just go, these guys were the coolest, right? You're just like, this is, this is the shit. And I'm a big, biggest Clapton fan in the world. I remember seeing Eric Clapton on the Journeyman tour when, he, when, when they branded him the Armani Blues Man, when he was dressing up in the suits. And I go, that was the coolest thing I've ever seen. I said, let me just try that, you know? And, um, and it worked, you know, it just worked. Is there anything at this point uh, that you, I mean, this is kind of a crazy question, but is there anything that you haven't done that you want to do? Do you think like that? Or do you have a five-year plan? Somebody once asked me that and it's just like, I went, what? I just dig what I'm doing. I'm just doing what I'm doing. I still like to play drum. But some people have that kind of, you know, five-year plan. They go, and this is what I'm going to do at some point. Do you have that or you just dig what you're doing and just, just take it one day at a time? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not a lifer. I mean, there'll be, there'll be a second act at some point. Um, I, I, I make this deal with myself. Um, as long as I can keep up, sing and play in what I think is a, a, the best or, or, or at a higher level. Um, the minute those skills start to erode and it just becomes like a, a slow descent back down the mountain, then it's time for me to hang it up. Um, and, you know, you want to go out on top. You want to go out making your best music um, of your life. You know, you, you know, we've all we've all known and seen artists that that spend a little bit too much time either on the road or doing their thing. And it, and it becomes it, it, it's not a, the word is not a legacy act. It, it becomes like you're just going to see them to pay tribute to the what it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What it was. You got to know, you got to know when to shut it down. You know, there's a lot of people that don't, don't want to even acknowledge that they think they're going to be 25 forever. That's, that's, that's not true. That's not me. Um, I mean, we're playing the Hollywood bowl. We're headlining the Hollywood bowl this year. That's a big deal. I mean, how many times have we been stuck on Highland going up to one oh one? I mean, cursing, you're, I mean you're, cursing the shows going, you're going to be, Damn bull shows! They're, 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 they're forty-five minutes to the valley just to just to get to Coanga. I want to be. I want in. I want to be. <laughs> yeah, you're going to be pissing off a lot of people outside the show. Jamming but a lot of Brooklyn, <laughs> Highland, La Brea. I want it all. Bar him. <laughs> yeah. I want it all. Well, dude, man, I- we know this. I want to be responsible for that at least one day in my life. <laughs> yeah. Well, dude, that's that's awesome. I mean. I I get it, man. That's the coolest feeling when you're there and you realize, you know, you know what it's like to be outside and wondering who's playing tonight. Oh man, look at all this traffic. And now you're that person. It's the right. greatest. You know, it you know, it's a few places, the venues like that. You play you played Red Rocks, you did a live record there, Madison Square Garden, maybe the form, Royal Albert Hall. I mean, you hit those are the big ones. Madison Square Garden, Royal Albert Hall, maybe Red Rocks, the Hollywood Bowl. Form. I mean, and, and that's that's it. It's not lost on me. Like, you know, I, I go get my Diet Cokes and water and I have to walk past Carnegie Hall. And I've done two nights there. I, you know, and I'm three blocks away from Radio City. I mean, I, I've hit it all. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's great. That's good. Cool. Yeah. Carnegie Hall, though, is, is, is one of those venues where we, we were warned going in about sonically. It's not designed for electric music. So we did an oh. acoustic show. Yeah. It's, oh, you did? Yeah. Because the... The, I don't know what they call them, the, the, the sticks, the, the half, uh, the, they're, they're like a, a bunch of um, skewers uh, together. And it's, it's like, it's, it's like, so you don't, you're not using a full stick on a snare. It's like, you've seen. Oh you know. yeah. The root, they're called like, uh, uh, yeah, the root, Rick Firth makes it the root, these are uh, blast sticks or 
bunch yeah, of the sticks yet. It's it, it's a yeah. take it down a peg or you, yeah. it's, a, it's a less intense. Yeah. And I remember being at Carnegie Hall and Anton Fig. Um, he's just he just sits down to the drum kit, and I know I, I, I just I just sit down in the center for the first time. And go, wow, look at this! This is like look, pull this off, Carnegie Hall. And all he did was take one of those little half stick things, and he hit the snare once, and it was like somebody shot off a gun. I'm like, <laughs> whoa, yeah. whoa! Yeah. And it was it was intense. I can't imagine even attempting an electric show in there. It would just be it would just be because it, it's in their defense, it was designed for. Recitals, opera singers, violinists, piano players, you know, going back to the, the late 1800s, there was no amplification. There was no PA. They, so it, it was designed to be a live room that you could just sing in and 2,600 people can see you, you know, and hear it. And but, you know, here we are, this rock and rollers coming in, thinking we know it all and then start banging on stuff. And it's like, whoa. I bet you there was a time that the people who booked that place said, we're not letting the rock and roll people in here. But the almighty dollar was like, hey, if we can book more shows, bring them in. Yeah. I mean, I, there's those great videos, OK, of Albert Collins, Roy Buchanan and Lonnie Mack live at Carnegie Hall. Couldn't imagine what it sounded like on the night. It, it had to be deafening because all those guys at that point in time in their career were like, I don't care where we are. The amp goes to here. This is it. No exceptions. You know, everybody was just dying. Wow. Well, Joe, Joe, um, it's awesome, awesome, awesome hanging with you. You know, usually when I see you, it's like I'm on stage. You come up, blow everybody away, and then you take off. And we had dinner, uh, uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago, which was awesome. But uh, I feel like I got to know you even more. This, you know, even though we've known each other forever, we've known, we've known each other forever, and and, and uh, it's it, it, it. Our musical adventures are always great because it it always involves a very very eclectic group of music that you guys have to learn. And I'm brought in as the blues guy, and I was I would tell you and Carmine Carmine Rojas, the bass player. Um, it's like, listen, don't worry about me, okay. <laughs> we're going to play the blues, okay? Yeah. We don't have to rehearse this, you know? Yeah, but I like to do it right. And your songs are badass. You got an edge. You got that New York Italian edge. And my mom grew up in the Bronx, my dad in Patterson. So I can relate to that. So I'm just like, whoa, you, you're you mellow. But when you get on that guitar and you start singing, there's some attitude and I love it. I completely, it sparks me. I'm a nice guy, but I play with bad intentions. That's, that's, that's <laughs> what my father Joe, man, thank you for coming on the podcast, man. I cannot wait to see you again. And I'm going to call you the unstoppable Joe Bonamassa now. That's your name. Thank you very much. All right, man.